Let's talk about story for a second. Everybody has a story, right? Everybody came, grew up with their mother, their father telling you a story. What do stories have more than anything else? A beginning, a middle, and an end, right? Always. But the stories also have a protagonist. Does everyone know what a protagonist is? Okay. And an antagonist. Many times stories, the antagonist is the person against the protagonist. Okay, but some stories, they, may not, they not, may not be completely clear exactly who the protagonist or antagonist is, okay? But the first thing that I want everyone to understand about telling movies, telling stories, is that there are three things that you want to create early on when you are thinking about telling your stories. Okay, atmosphere. Anybody know how to know the word atmosphere? The atmosphere, what the story, the, prim the, the idea of the the film is in, the actual, um, where the story takes place, how it comes about. The second thing is the premise, and the premise can be defined basically as what is the actual idea of the movie, okay? The idea is a man robs a bank, when he goes to the bank, someone is there he used to love, and he realizes that he can't rob the bank because he'll, she'll lose her job. That's like a premise. There's no story yet. There's no plot, no characters. It's a premise, okay? Something that someone pitches you, okay? So you can have an atmosphere. The atmosphere is a man needs something. If there's a bank, he's in a city. There's a job that's needed. The premise is what I just explained, and then the story begins, and the story, is like any story, it has to have a hero character, a character who is the person we're going to follow, we're going to either love or hate. Okay, so if we think about stories in a very simple way, as atmosphere, theme, premise, I didn't talk about theme yet, because theme is a really important thing, atmosphere, premise, and then the story, then we kick in the word theme. And theme, for anybody trying to tell a, a, a movie, is probably the most important thing we all want to do, want to have when we're writing a movie. Because the theme is why we are doing the film. So if you are thinking about writing a film, and you're saying, what's this film really about? What's the film really about? And you, usually the theme is one word, possession, loss. Redemption, um, some one word, and when you think about that word, when you're writing your screenplay, you're always going back to the theme. You're always going back to that one word because when you get lost, you're writing your script and you realize, I'm lost, I don't know where I'm going. What is that every scene must hammer out the theme. And the theme, it just helps you with the characters, with the scenes, with the plot, the theme is whatever you think is the best thing that keeps the story alive, okay? So what I'm going to ask you now is give me a story, just one line. They call this in Hollywood the log line, log line, the line, one line of your story that you like to actually tell. Uh, what would be a log line of a, a story that you want to tell? And then tell me the theme, from the log line. Uh, we can all build these stories with a great character because of the circumstances, their backstories, their life story, past, future, and present can build out every single thing one needs to build a single great film story. Okay, think about something right now because this is gonna be part of the assignment I'm gonna give you, okay? How you were raised, how you grew up, where did you hear stories from your parents or grandparents or the older people around you? Okay? Stories about your past, your loved ones, living or dead, religious stories, and larger than life stories of people, places that you could never ever imagine going to. You, t you can tell these stories to each other. We read about them as we grow up. How could we make these stories into a movie? So the assignment I want to give you, I want 
two pages of a screenplay based on the format that it's here is the beginning of a story with this instruction. I'll repeat it again. The instruction is stories about your past, your parents, your grandparents, someone living or dead, religious stories, or larger than life stories, okay? Or finally, stories that you, of places that you could never imagine going to, okay? Create a character, a premise, and in two pages, a plot. Now, it's gonna be hard to create a plot in two pages. You can create a premise, you can create a character, you can create an atmosphere. Do you understand what I say by atmosphere? Atmosphere is, and I'll, I'll explain it to you right now, I'll give you some information on here, on the screen here. So, we were talking about the style of writing. And what I want everyone to be able to do is be able to write screenplays because the essence of every movie, you cannot go on set, you cannot get a job, you cannot hire people unless you have a screenplay written in this style. Okay, people write screenplays in other styles and it's hard to budget the movie. These styles make, sure, make, make it very important and very easy to budget a movie with the new modern programs that budget films. So the style's important, the way you write the screenplay is important, that's content, but the, the way the film is laid out in terms of the pages, the spacing, the dialogue, all that stuff is based on what is used in the industry standard around the world, okay? So what I would want everyone to do is think about not just writing a story that is about your family or about this, this, this assignment I gave you, but think about the fact that you could actually, this could be the first two pages of a film you could write to sell, write to make a living. Because when I am standing here and telling you I've been making a living for 22 years as a writer, I was writing journalism first, but I decided I wanted to tell narrative stories. And I wrote a screenplay one day. I was sitting in my house in Chicago I had broken both of my ankles. I was in a wheelchair. I didn't have any place to go. I couldn't move. My whole summer, my whole, my girlfriend left me. It was a terrible time. I said, what do I want to do? I love movies. I love movies. So I decided to write my first movie. And I wrote my first movie because I love movies. I would see movies all the time. This is before DVDs came out, before VHS. <laughs> I was going to the movies every day, paying money, sneaking in, seeing my friends, movies, 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 movies. I didn't even care about TV, I was watching movies. So I figured, let me make movies. So I hired a writer, and he did a terrible job. And I hired another writer, and I was directing. He did another terrible job. And I thought, what do I want to do? How do I want to make movies? So I got a book. I read a book, and I watched a movie with the book on my lap, and the book of the movie was on my lap, and the movie was playing on the, on t on the screen. I looked at every single scene, and I thought, if I can write the way that looks, I could make this my living. If I can conjure up stories, actually, that I could create originally myself, someone will call me and say, I like your writing, and I want to hire you to do it again to write one of our movies. So the empowerment I'm trying to give each one of you as potential screenwriters in Ethiopia or the world is the empowerment to write films very specifically about where you are, but absolutely universal in terms of the story content. I'll give you another example. I wrote a movie about my family when I was a kid eight-year-old kid, nine-year-old kid. My family. My family is like your family. There's a mom, there's a father, there's my brothers and sisters, we fight each other, my family. And we were growing up in Chicago and the neighborhood I lived in started to change. People started moving in, moving out. 
It was funny to me because I would make a friend, he'd move away. I'd make another friend, he'd move away. I kept thinking, this is kind of weird. Don't make friends, you know? They keep moving away. But then I realized that I had one friend who was the toughest kid on the block. I wanted to tell his story, and I remembered his story. Now, the screenplay I wrote was from memory. And I wrote it so fast that when I was finished writing it, I was crying. I wrote it so quickly. It was like this, this thing came out of me because I remembered every single thing that happened. When I finished the screenplay, I gave it to a friend. He read it. He cried. I thought, hmm, there's something here. Maybe I did something in the writing. Maybe I did something in the style of writing. Maybe I learned something by reading that book that made the transmission of my words absolutely universal to anybody. He said, you should send it to Hollywood. I said, okay. You should. I said, well, I got my job and I have my responsibilities and I don't think I could, you know. He said, put it in the envelope, send it to somebody, anybody, and I did. A year later, I got a phone call from Steven Spielberg. Okay? It got to him somehow. Do you know? And I got a phone call. He told me he bought my screenplay because the family in the story was so similar to his family. Mom and father and the kids were fighting and the neighborhood was changing and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Who knew? The universal story is the specific story. The absolutely, absolutely specific story of your life. It is so universal. So if you write a general movie, some action movie, everybody's shooting each other up, it's general. You know, anybody can play the roles. It's interchangeable. You don't remember the story. But the specific stories, the ones that go really far, are stories that are very, very unique and that everyone can relate to. So that's what I'm asking you, as potential screenwriters telling narrative stories that may or may not be true, create characters that can grow bigger on the screen, grow bigger on the page, grow bigger in your mind. Okay? Look at this, this page for a second. This character, Tony, he's a British, he's living, he's in some city in Africa. Okay, he's sitting there, and it, it's, you, you get a sense when you see the second line, music can be heard from all directions. Create a company of whistling sounds that fill the air. Right away, we get a sense what this place feels like. We don't know if we're in Namibia, Ethiopia, Sierra Leone, or South Africa, but we, don't, we get a simple, an idea. It's some place we haven't quite been to before. We can feel it, okay? It's lunchtime. Now we know the atmosphere. We know the premise. It's full of people, full of women carrying bundles on their heads, men carrying anything and everything. He, a white truck being unloaded across the street. Now we're visualizing what he's visualizing. And look at the point of view of the story, and that's what we'll talk about more specifically when we get into writing, is the point of view of the story. This is what they call a third-person story. They call it the omnipotent point of view, looking down at the situation. Tony's not narrating his story. Some person is not telling Tony's story. The story is being told from a third person, the eye view, from they call it the God's view, looking down. We're falling down into a story that's already going. It's called the third person. You read novels that way, third person. You read novels from the first person, where it says, when I grew up, I saw Tony on the street. And that damn Tony, I wanted to kick his ass. Okay, first person. Here's the story of Tony. At the curb, sitting on the curb, is this kid, Bibi. Okay? And now we introduce this kid. 
And what makes a screenplay? Dialogue. Okay? We described BB. He's wearing oversized shirt, cargo pants, old crepes, which are flip-flops. Uh, he looks over at Tony eating his food. He motions for the kid to come over. Now, we can all see this visually. We can actually see these scenes, right? You know where you can actually feel a director who's going to direct the film could say, OK, I can put the camera here. He walks over from here. He's here. That's the, thing, that's the thing about a screenplay. It's called the architecture of movies. You're building the house. You cannot make a movie unless you have a house built. They can't hire 250 people and put 100,000, 200,000, 2 million, 20 million dollars down unless this is right. It tells a story. So we're building the architecture now. The architecture, he shrugs. What do you want? Tony repeats, come here. Come over here. He walks over and sits next to him. They have a conversation. The conversation is, he's not even looking at this kid. This kid's not looking at him. But what you have is this kid and this older man talking, and they seem like they need each other. You want to bite. BB right away says, I fought in the Civil War. Good. My side lost. In two lines, we got their circumstances. In two lines. You want to bite? BB's putting his chest out saying, I fought in the Civil War. It's like he's telling this white man, I fought in the Civil War. What do you want? Okay? What do you, what do you want? Okay? And then he says, good. So he gives him a little praise. Good. My side lost. What's this guy doing here? <laughs> what side was he on? What did he, what'd he do? I don't believe in free lunches. So BB's thinking about something else. He wants to know, what's this guy want? Why are you calling me over here? All the dialogue is doing is pushing the story forward. And you see in dialogue, in good screenwriting, dialogue is economy. One line, two lines, maybe a, a speech. But how do we talk in real life? We talk in little bits. We talk over each other. We give information sometimes not directly. If I want to get to know you, I may say something to you, maybe directly, maybe not indirectly. BB's trying to talk to him indirectly. He says, me neither. I agree with you. What you want. He gets right to the point. You want to make some money. He looks at him curiously. I'll give you 50 bucks American. Show me. So he pulls out the money, right? How? He puts his hand to his, like a gun, say, like, boom. He says, I'm not stupid. Oh, of course not. Isn't it easy 50 bucks, so? So he knows the kid was in a civil war, and the kid probably was a killer, or at least did it. He says, okay, 250, that's what I want. What's your name, BB? It's easy, like Bridget Bardot. Who's she? Well, this kid's 15 years old. He wouldn't know who Bridget Bardot is, right? Most people here don't know who Bridget Bardot is. She was a, a French actress from the 60s and 70s. This guy is old enough to reference that. He's thinking in his own world. He doesn't care if the kid knows who he is or not. He said, oh, an old movie, French movie star. Never heard of him. No matter, I have a job for you, BB, and I want 250. They're making a deal. 250 is a lot. My side lost the war. And then so BB now is in it. What's his name? He's going to do it. Why do you want to know a name? Names are interesting. So he's hired a killer. Right away, the kid has been sort of tagged. Right away, this man has someone he wants to do a job for him. Right away, he's interested. 
Now we see Tony, messy eater, he pulls the last bike, cleans up, takes a lot of money, peels off 20s, all American money. He frowns, damn. I have to owe you 10 bucks. Okay. Tony hands the money to BB. BB stuffs in his pocket, pulls out a plastic market bag. He takes it, opens it up. He pulls out a small gun. BB wants to know his name. Something about names for BB is important. Okay? He opens the newspaper. He turns to the commercial ads in the paper. He stops and points at a page. BB looks at it. Guy says, That's him. He's a gun seller. He's a white man, businessman. He points to a group of young workers across the street, unloading the trucks from uh, computers from a truck. Tony says, He wants to be dead. And Bibi says, as any person would say, leave, fly away where you came from. Can't, no papers. Stuck here, just like me. So now they're in the same situation. This guy was supplying guns for war. He has no papers to leave. He can't get out. He has people chasing him. He needs his kid to protect him. He can't do the job himself. He won't do the job himself. But he knows the kid may take 250 and do a form. Premise, characters, story, not quite developed yet. Not a plot yet. But we have at the beginning of this story three things. Atmosphere, premise, characters. Okay? These are the key things. And we have what pushes it further. Dialogue. We've seen movies where dialogue doesn't quite exist in the first two, two pages. If you are writing that line, BB doesn't know, BB doesn't care, that's an editorial line of a feeling that we think BB has. Now, most screenplays don't do that. But that's a bit of a cheat. You're cheating. That's a, a stylistic thing. OK? The writer is saying, I want you to know a little bit more about BB without him saying it. Some screenplays never do that. They let you find out about what he loves, what he cares, doesn't know later on. But I think at the start of this story, the writing is to give you a sense more of the kid more of his personality early, more of his psychology early. This is the first page of a Academy Award winning screenplay for a movie called The Silence of the Lambs. It's a, it's a kind of a psychological thriller where a man is uh, basically murdering women and taking their skin and, and building skin for his own self taking skins of women and putting it on himself so he can become someone different. It's an eerie movie. And it's about another serial killer who's locked up, being interrogated by an FBI or American interrogator, a woman, trying to figure out the psychology of a person who would do that. So we have a man who's doing these terrible things. We have another man who knows how, to, these, how people do these terrible things. And he, in fact, does the same thing. He eats people. So we have a man who eats people and a man who takes skin off women. And we have a woman trying to find this killer. OK? It's a very intense psychological drama. It became a huge hit. And they made three sequels. And it won the best picture of the year because it was so well told, I gave you what they call the log line a minute ago. A woman chasing a man. A cop chasing a robber. A cop chasing a killer. A devious killer. A psychologically damaged killer. Doing horrendous things to someone. But what we also see in this story is a lot of love and care and lots of incredible character 
relationships between these three people, two people particularly. It was well written. And as you see in this first scene, it's all description. This film was based on a novel. The novel was called A Silence of the Lambs. Um, the description by the screenwriter, he decided to take a lot of the description from the novel. As you see in this description, it explains a lot. It gives you where things are, what people look like, what they're wearing. It gives you also in the description, particularly after close on, suddenly with a sharp crack, the, the door, the knob up explodes and the door bursts open. So what we see here is actual directorial instruction. Some directors who don't write screenplays don't want you to do that. They want you just to show me the scene, don't give me the snap, crackle, and pop. Okay? This writer decided he wanted to give as much information as possible, be as descriptive if, 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 as possible. Clarice, the lead character in this entire movie, we follow her. Look at the formatting of the movie. Clarice Starling is the name of the woman. And Clarice is capitalized always. When you bring a character into a movie, you always capitalize her. We don't capitalize her each time, but the first time we do. Every new time, new character we bring in, we make them capitals. We also describe what they look like. We describe sometimes what they're wearing. Okay? We describe what she has in her hands. These, all these things sometimes come up later in a story because they're used as what they call callbacks. Another term, another screenwriting term. Sometimes you introduce something in a movie early, a clue, a character, a walk, a color. Sometimes you call it back midway through the movie as, a, as something that needs to be explored or explained. It's, it's a clue, it's a plot device. It's used a lot in stories. And this is important because the revolver, the gun she uses, in the end of the movie, she doesn't have it. And it becomes a very difficult situation for her because she always has to have her gun because she's an FBI agent, okay? So as you see in this whole description, this whole page, this whole thing, there's not, there's only one page of dialogue, one line of dialogue. She says, freeze. That's in the first page of the script. This is called, the first line says hotel, room. That's called where you are, the, the line, the, the location, the slug line. They call it slugging you in. The next thing is all action. Clarice's point of view. So now if the director is watching, reading the screenplay, he's saying, what am I looking at? What am I looking at? Clarice's point of view, that means the camera's right where Clarice is, right here. So the writer has to sh put the camera where he wants the audience to see. So it says Clarice's point of view, the camera's right there. Okay? The director is being told, put the camera at her eye line, looking out. Close on is close up. Close on is, it means if, I am, if the camera is on you, and it says close on your camera, it says close on your camera, it means pop in, cut close to your camera. So that means the audience should see your camera as a close up. It says close on a guest room door. So the first we were on Clarice with the gun walking through, camera on her, now reverse, close on the camera, close on the door. Sharp, small wire pack attached to it, boom, they blow the door up. So the camera's right on the door. The director, director wants to see where he's gonna shoot. So it says close on, very important. So if we're shooting a scene right here, and it says you walk across the room, close on the side of your face. 
That means the camera, there's an instruction for the director, if you're the director, to go close down. It is like editing. You're editing while you're, you're, while you're writing. So we're being very descriptive and very, very detailed about what we should see on the screen, okay? Some screenplays have no description. Just dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. And you'll see in these books, there's just some, they don't even put description in. They're giving every single discretion to the director. He can design the room, he can design every single thing that happens on the screen, because it's all about the dialogue. Stylistically, things change each time. This screenplay, based on a novel, based on a director wanting this writer to work closely with him, said, I need to show me everything. Show me what you want me to shoot. Show me what you want me to shoot. Okay, so as you see, it's, everything's here. The screenplay, like I said, is the architecture, the blueprint for the movie. So everyone who's seen the movie, this is for them. This is not for general public consumption. This is not a novel. This is what is uh, considered, I guess, in a lot of ways, since Hollywood's been around 110 years, or uh, starting in France, the filmmaking business have always had instructions. These are instructions. This is like office paper, what you need to do to make this building work. These are the blueprints of every movie. So this description is for the people working on the movie. People who are hired, the production designer, the costume designer, the cast, you know, the casting director, they have to see every single thing because when you start making a movie, every single line is important. This first paragraph right here for a production designer is the most important paragraph he's going to ever have for Clarice Starling because he's got to design what she's wearing, design what everyone else is wearing, design everything around her, get the gun, Get the right gun. These, every single line, if you watch a screenplay that's put together by a production designer, and he's doing his job, it's going to be yellow lines on every single line, because this is his job to get me, as a director, the gun, the speed loader, the baseball cap. Every single person who works in this set has a job. This is their blueprint. The casting director wants to know what Clarice is going to look like. There it is right there. She's mid-20s, she's trim, she's very pretty. That's not a lot to go on. That means the director and the casting director has a lot of discretion who they're going to hire. Okay? Three lines describing this character. In a novel, it'd be probably three pages describing her. But in the screenplay, it is the architecture, the blueprint, and the abbreviation. That means all of this stuff is a language. It's a language to learn. In addition to learning screenwriting language, it's important to learn the language because you may all may not want to be screenwriters. You may want to be a costume designer or a grip or a gaffer. I can explain all those terms to you. Or the, the director, the assistant director, the production designer, the assistant production designer, the craftsman. Every person has to have a script with them at all times, and broken down so they can do their jobs, so they can get paid, so they can do the next job. They learn this craft, and there's a lot of crafts to learn on, this, on, a, movie, on a movie set. <laughs> we're talking about filmmaking now, okay? So uh, we're talking about blueprint, but unlike, unlike a building where if I was to change the blueprint of this building, this building would fall down. This blueprint is amorphous. It's a bit of a director. If you're directing the movie, and you say, you know what? I don't like that Clarice is a woman. I want to be Clarence. I want to be a guy. Well, that's the director's prerogative. Now the director's got to go into the boss and say, I'm going to make him a guy now. The boss says, no, 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 I want a woman. That's the director's job. The director is interpreting. The interpretation of the screenplay is the most important thing the director does. It's, the term is called plussing the script. This is a script. Approved, paid for. They got all these people to, to work on the movie now. The director now walks in, starts rehearsing the actors. He says, OK, let's do the scene. He says, the scene works this way, but I want the scene to work a little differently. I want to work where everything, the point of view is different. 
I want it narrated by somebody else. I want the acting to be different. I want the style to be different. The director or the auteur is the most important person on the set to create the movie. The director will interpret this film any way he wants or she wants. But the blueprint is for everyone to do their job. Okay, we cannot go on the set, we cannot hire people, we cannot even raise money. That's why I have a, blu a blueprint. I'll give you a good example. Uh, two, two, year, two years ago, I was here in Ethiopia teaching with Blue Nile. A student uh, was in the class, she, we talked, we had a great time. She had a great story idea about a 12-year-old girl, 13-year-old girl, who has a feeling of sexuality coming on. Something you don't talk about a lot in Ethiopia for, for little girls, for preteen. She wanted to make a movie out of it. Ooh, tough, right? Tough story. Countryside, she's not a city girl. She lives in a village. Interesting story. I go home, she sends me the premise. The premise, just the idea, the two or three lines. We talk, a lot of emailing back and forth. The more we talked over weeks and weeks and weeks, the more I realized that this story was her story. But she didn't want to reveal that because it's a movie she's making. But then I realized it's her story. So I do not pry. We work on the story. She gets the script done perfectly. It wins awards. She gets money from France and Germany. She makes the movie. It premiered at Venice Film Fest this year in Toronto. And it's going all over the world. It's going to be Sundance. OK, from here, from the city. OK, so you know, we can do this. All right? We can do this. And the story is so unique and so completely specific. Very specific. But you can relate to it. Anybody from North Dakota, America, to Slovenia, to Japan can relate to the story because we're all human, right? So I related to it, sitting in my apartment in Los Angeles. I said, I can relate to this. And we start working on it. And eventually I said, okay, go. I can't work with you anymore. You have to do it on your own now. You have to do the final draft yourself. She did it. She got on the set. She directed it. She cut it. She finished her movie, and now it's winning awards. So what I'm saying is that she interpreted her own story a little bit different than the first premise she gave me. I, I asked her, oh, I saw the story. The film is different than when we first talked about it. I interpreted it differently. I said, ah, director's prerogative. Director's prerogative. Because she is a director. She said, I'm going to do this my way. You can do a story your way, you change it when you want to. The blueprint is what we're going to learn first. If you give him money to make a movie, and you bought the screenplay, or you hired her to write the screenplay, and you love the screenplay, you say, okay, make my movie. You say, okay, I'm paying you to make my movie that she wrote, and her name's on it, and you produced it, and he starts changing it, making it a little different. All of a sudden, it's all people talking different ways. You're going to be upset, right? You're going to say, whoa, I bought this. I hired you. She's upset. What's going on here? He's a director. You're the producer. You have some, pay, some play here. So you have to say to him, listen, I love this screenplay. She did a wonderful job. Please don't change the screenplay. So you have discretion. But you must have got the job for a reason, because you love the script. Right? There it is. You don't want to change something that you love to the point where it's unrecognizable to the people who hired you or anybody else. You can interpret it. You can plus it. You don't want to change it. Now, there's a thing about authority, director's authority. You have authority on the set. But when it comes to the screenplay, the reason why everyone's here on the set is because they want to see the movie made, the one they're reading, the one they came to being hired and paid for. They're coming here because they want to do the movie that they have in front of them. Not something that you rewrote last night. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's the difference. <laughs>